Uh, we spared you the drums this morning, as you notice, because it's a bit early. We, we, we would never have found a drummer to arrive this early anyway. <laughs> anyway, um, what um, I'm hoping to uh, bring across this morning is a little bit about uh, the rapid development of recording technologies and um, how music you know, through that technology is now being written, performed, and consumed, as well as uh, how it's being recorded. So um, we're going to start by taking a, a, a brief look at uh, how, how sound recording started. And I'll illustrate that with a short clip from the, uh, the uh, series that was mentioned earlier, called The Art and Science of Sound Recording. Ever since we've been able to communicate using speech, we've been able to hear our own voice reproduced in the natural world through echoes. Sound waves that travel to and bounce back from hard reflective surfaces like Hello. these rock faces. But being able to capture and store these waves Hello. is a surprisingly recent invention. Thomas Edison started it all with his invention of the phonograph in 1877. Mary had a little lamb, it squeaked with white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb would sure to go. If we could travel back in time, imagine how difficult it would be to explain to somebody from the late 19th century what sound recording was. We could have said it's like the sound equivalent of how the camera, invented just a couple of decades earlier, can store an image, or we could have said it's a bit like a mechanical parrot that will squawk back exactly what we say to it at the touch of a button. Mary had a little lamb, it squeaked quite as slow. When Thomas Edison first publicly displayed his phonograph, it was to huge acclaim, and it instantly made him world famous. Interestingly, Edison hadn't foreseen that one of the principal applications of his invention would be for the reproduction of music. of the video, so hey. Um, when, I was, uh, when I was 19, um, soon after leaving school, um, I managed to secure a job at the famous Abbey Road Studios in London. And um, I'd only been a trainee engineer for a matter of weeks when I was assigned the dream assignment. They said, we'd like you to go down to the Apple building and help record the Beatles. So I said, okay, fine with me, yeah. Um, and uh, well, I, I duly arrived, um, was ushered into this, uh, this basement uh, chamber where I opened the door and there were all four Beatles, Linda Eastman, later Linda McCartney, Yoko Ono, Glenn Jones, the engineer, and George Martin. Hello, I'm Alan. I've come to uh, help out uh, on the session, and they, they, they were very welcoming. They were very nice. So a lot of uh, film crews and so on going on there, milling about, because that's what they were doing. They were making a, they were making a movie as well as an album. And um, <clears throat> what, uh, what struck me was that, uh, that they had decided to make a live album, a live album under, under sort of studio conditions. And uh, that, I think, that was largely led by the company. You know, I would love a little swig of water. Of the water that somebody um, yeah. <laughs> um, the Yes, they, they wanted to make a, a, a live uh, studio album. And um, that was made particularly difficult because the, the newly built studio um, had been designed by this infamous character called Magic Alex, who uh, built a console that simply did not work. 
And um, George Martin uh, called uh, called Abbey Road and said, "Help! We're in trouble. We're not to stop here. We're trying to trying to record." So they uh, thank you very much. That's water. <laughs> um, and so we 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 were uh, assigned to to come down and uh, install this, this this gear, and I was the, the tape operator. And, uh, there were all these uh, wonderful songs going on. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, the, the album, as we know it, included that uh, that wonderful uh, rooftop session, of course, and um, that's that's pretty much the way that. that Beatles at the time had intended it to happen. Enter Phil Spector, who got involved in it, and he completely took away that, that sort of basic premise that it would be a, a, a live album, and he had an orchestra, a choir, all, all kinds of stuff. And um, I read in, uh, Glyn John saying in an interview, the album was great until Phil Spector puked on it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, at least they released the uh, a naked version of the album a few years later, so we can make our own decision whether Phil Spector was right or wrong. Um, their previous uh, two albums, the White Album and, and Sgt. Pepper, of course, had been very uh, substantially uh, uh, recorded with studio tricks, uh, you know, using a lot of uh, you know, technology to, 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 to make incredible vocal sounds and sound effects and so on. And um, the Beatles were kind of well known for pushing that envelope you know, to, to make maximum advantage of you know, available technology. I can, uh, let me see if it's better this one. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you for your much better. Um, yes, they, they'd been uh, somewhat uh, famous for Pushing the envelope of technology, and um, I think perhaps "Let It Be" was uh, an effort to get back to their roots and become, you know, a performing rock band again. And that's really what the what the rooftop session is all about. And uh, <clears throat> of course, these days, um, new technologies are replaced, updated. Uh, I mean, we don't we don't hold on to a computer or a mobile phone more. Sometimes only a year. Dude, you only have an iPad 97. <laughs> so yeah, it's just it's just the way things are, and and in in some ways, in a recording technology, it's gone the same way. There's every week there's some new application changing the sound of the vocal or the instrument, some kind of technical process. And um, my my fear is that uh, we're losing sight of the, the most important thing in any music recording, and that's the material, the song, the performance, what the artist puts in. Um, and this, this rapidly changing technology is in contrast, interestingly, to um, the lifespan that magnetic tape had. Uh, magnetic tape came along right after the war, the Second World War, and um, you can still play tapes recorded then, today. Try, try finding some way to play a beat tonight tape today. <laughs> so, um, a, a good example of that is uh, my father uh, bought uh, one of the, the first Ferrograph tape recorders when I was three years old to record me singing songs in my bathtub. <laughs> and um, I was still using that same machine 35 years later. It's incredible how... how uh, Magnetic tape played a part in the development of recording. I'm going to play another little clip from the uh, Art Sounds for Sound recording, which is all about all about magnetic magnetic tape. The Ampex Company started making magnetic tape recorders in the 1940s. Tape, in countless incarnations and variations, became the standard recording and playback medium from the 1950s through to the turn of the century. The technology of magnetic tape opened up sound recording to a whole new generation of artists and along with them, a new breed of professional technicians, engineers and producers. 
But as the Grammy people will tell you, it's not just the technology, it's what you do with that technology that counts. And one can't really live without the other. The Beatles had a big influence on the way that recording technology developed. When they recorded Please Please Me, the whole album, amazingly, was recorded in a day. And as George Harrison famously quoted, the second album took even longer. In those days, they recorded on two-track, quarter-inch tape. To make an overdub, or a superimposition, as Abbey Road called it, they would copy one tape to another while adding the new material. The rhythm track, or instruments, would usually be on track one, and the vocals on track two. These two tracks were then mixed down to mono for the final master. Somewhat hilariously, the two-track tape was also released as a so-called stereo version, where the backing track was on the left and the vocals were on the right. Right up to Sgt. Pepper, stereo was just an afterthought, but Pepper was a big turning point. Four-track had arrived by then, along with the ability to overdub new material onto the same tape and remain in sync, a previously impossible feat. The complexity of the album involved huge engineering challenges, and Jeff Emmerich was the recipient of a well-deserved Grammy for his work as engineer of the album. It's still hard to believe that it was recorded on four-track. By the time I'd started at Abbey Road, we were recording the Beatles on eight-track. Then came 16-track, the format we used to record Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Then 24-track. Will it ever end, we asked. The answer was no, it probably wouldn't, because before long... Digital technology came along and allowed us to have an unlimited number of tracks at our disposal. Okay, so there was a brief mention there of uh, an album which was quite successful called Dark Side of the Moon, um, which I was fortunate enough to be the engineer on. <laughs> that would normally be a clip to a, 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 a chance to play, play a, a track from it, but uh, we're a bit short time. I think you probably know the album reasonably well. <laughs> But um, th there, there was another act that, uh, that really did uh, take maximum advantage of, of, of the uh, available technology. Sometimes uh, we needed so many tape machines that we would have to plug in uh, one control room into another when, when it wasn't working, and we would have cables running down the corridors in the studio with the tape machines outside. Um, that's how it was done in those days. In the, in the early 70s, uh, all time based processing was done with tape. These days it's all done with uh, digital black boxes and digital echoes and reverbs and uh, magic uh, digital processing devices. But back then it was all analog, it was all done with tape. Um, and one particular um, piece of uh, analog tape technology was the, um, you remember the, uh, the loop that opens the song running? Those <laughs> sounds. That was enormously difficult to achieve uh, with uh, the available technology. We eventually had to record uh, each each of those sounds on, on a track of a four-track tape. That was because it was going to be released in quadraphonic. So we had four tracks instead of just eight. And um, the only way of getting a, a, a loop that was in time, rhythmically in time, was to physically take the tape, measure it with a ruler, chop it, stick it together, Take the next sound, chop that to exactly the same length, cut that one. And then we made a continuous loop around uh, mic stands, around the tape machine. And that's what the band played to. The band played to that loop at the beginning of the song. You really shouldn't play to that loop. <laughs> play it when you get home. <laughs> um, so, Pink Floyd, yes. Uh, they uh, Sadly, we only made that, uh, that one record together. Because I... I'd started uh, to get involved in production as well as the engineering at that time. But, um, the early, early successes I had um, were um, totally remarkable uh, for a young producer. Um, I had two consecutive number one rec records in the UK with Pilot and Cotney Rubber. Uh, so, got very drunk that night. <laughs> 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 So, um, of 
course, um, those, those, those sounds that I was just talking about, the... Uh, oops. Ah! Oh, it didn't go on my computer. That's the um, yes, make, making that uh, tape loop would have been, um, you know, would have taken five minutes using, using a hard disk recorder or Pro Tools or whatever. So, uh, you know, things have changed. Um, Uh, my, my experiences with um, you know, uh, growing up at uh, Abbey Road Studios and recording with uh, such, a diverse, such a diverse range of artists, you know, one day it would be an opera singer, the next day it would be uh, a rock band, the next day it would be a Muzak session. Um, but uh, I, I think I was enormously influenced by uh, the famous classical artists of the day. They, they include Otto Klumpfer, Sir John Barbaroli, Sir Adrian Bolt, uh, Daniel Barenboim, Itzhak Perlman, all, all, all huge names in classical music field. And uh, I, I loved classical music so much and the sound of orchestra. And that kind of rubbed off on me when uh, we created the Alan Parsons Project, which uh, some people don't actually realize it's quite heavily orchestrated. It, it, for some reason, I got a, got a strange reputation of being a sort of electronic music guy. I had all these, you know, because I had all these weird and wonderful sounds, but so many, so many of those sounds were actually made with orchestra. And uh, the, the sad thing is that uh, modern music listeners, I think, have lost sight of what, uh, what an orchestra sounds like, because so few orchestral uh, players are featured on, on modern records. And um, I think that's uh, very limited. Um, and, you know, as long as I'm making records, I'm going to employ arrangers and, uh, and orchestral players. It's, it's the real thing. It's the real difference. And that's important. Um, of course, I made my mark with the Alan Parsons Project um, as a maker of concept albums um, in an age where people would bring home their shiny new 12-inch vinyl album. Kids call those big black CDs, <laughs> and we would, you know, we would turn the lights down and optionally get into an altered state, <laughs> <laughs> listen to uh, listen to this thing from start to finish. You know. but these days, there's too many. Uh, you know, the lifespan, the um, attention span, is just so so short these days with the internet, texting, phones. Internet, uh, phones, uh, all these uh, video games. There's another future. Um, so it's it's hard to get people in a, in a, in, into a room listening to say 45, 50 minutes of music. Everything is now three minutes long. Uh, it's 99 cents on iTunes. That's that's the way music is delivered. These days. So um, it's it, it's a um, it's also a sad thing that um, you know. It, while we are in this uh, three-minute download world, we, uh, we've been, been kind of forced to uh, suffer this dreadful format called MP3. And uh, you know, the audio files are infuriated by, by MP3. And so are uh, just you know, pro, pro audio guys like myself. So um, you know, if we look on the bright side, um, things are going to get better. Computers are getting faster, download times are, are becoming quicker. Uh, the, the memory capacity of our computers and storage devices is, is getting greater. So um, I think we have a, a bright for, a future to look forward to in terms of uh, quality of sound, but you know, there, there must be a movement to, uh, to, to get that quality level up. It's uh, no good uh, listening on a horrible little iPad on your uh, the horrible little uh, pair of uh, earbuds on, on coming out of your iPad or your iPhone. And I, uh, I strongly uh, oppose that. People should really get back into having nice uh, home hi fi setups and uh, big loudspeakers. <laughs> and an extension of that is surround sound. I mean, surround sound is great. I mean, Probably most, a good many of you in this room have got some kind of surround facility to watch movies on. And there's 
the systems that cost over 200 bucks. So, um, but who listens to music in Sri Lanka? Almost nobody. It's so sad because there's, there's great stuff out there. Um, all the uh, all the classic albums of, of the 70s were, were were mixed in quadraphonic, which is we've got a dance set them included, and that's just come out in a box set. Um, I wish uh, you know, I wish there was a movement to uh, increase the, uh, the penetration of, of surround sound music. And, uh, there's one thing I can achieve in this talk would be to try and bring back surround music. Um, yes, te technology has now become a thing that, that is, is totally dominating modern music. And uh, as I said earlier, the most important thing is the song, the artist, the performance. And, it, and the technology should be a catalyst, not a, not a control. And, uh, I've, I've tried in, in, uh, in my own little way to, to always you know, make, make the, the song come first. And, Use the technology as as a helper, not not to take the technology. But what can we do with this effect? You know, it's, it's a bit like uh, it's a bit like a magician um, finding the means to do a magic trick before he actually comes up with the effect. It's, it's the same kind of argument. Um, there's. Uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I, I will skip that last clip I was going to say. Um, no, we'll, we'll do it. Let's play it now. This, this, this is what happens in, in the modern world. And my example where, would be like if I got a tape from you to mix got, something. Jimmy Duff would never happen. You should mix it fine by yourself. But should, should, that, should that happen, I know what I'm going to, I know what I, I can tell you what I'm going to expect to see. I'm gonna, if, if it was a multi track, I'm going to expect to see X amount of tracks. They're going to be laid out, their effects with them, and so forth. And pretty much I can put it down, open it up on the board, and then I, right off the bat, I've got a basic record I can now play. And now I can do what I need to do. As opposed to, what I will expect today is I will expect a file from here, a file from here, a file from here, a file from here, and a file from here, and I gotta put them all together. There's duplicates. They're not really duplicate because he punched in one line and one of those ones. Well, which one is it? Well, I don't know, you have to listen to it and find out. So now I'm sitting here listening and comparing for half my, half my time, most of my time, just listening and comparing. I'll do a mix, and they'll go, did you listen to the rough? Actually, I didn't want to listen to the rough. I wanted to give you what I thought it should be. Oh, we love the rough. We love the rough. Don't you understand that? So now I'm sitting and comparing everything in the rough to all the stuff. And now, you know what? I'm not giving you anything that I wanted to give you because I'm tired. <laughs> so that's, that's where we are with modern technology, sadly. Uh, and I'm, I've always tried to, um, to stick to the, uh, to, the, to the basics. And, uh, Treat uh, hard disk recording just like a tape machine, just like the old days. Um, I'll just wrap up by um, saying um, what I'm going to be doing next. Um, it, it, may, it may surprise you. I'm going to be working with uh, the ultimate low tech uh, facilities recording a virtuoso ukulele player called Jake Shimo, uh, Shimo Bakura. Amazing guy, look him up on the internet. So that's my next uh, adventure. Ultimate low tech, probably no plugins, probably no digital anything. But enough said. Thank you so much.